but some of it isn't. They're going to have to, where it comes out of the mountain, they have to suspend it because there's not enough, there's no place to bury it. So there's lots of evidence of um, avalanche and rockfall damage in this area. Um, Barry mentioned he did a bunch of work in here. Yeah, so, you know, things like boulders are falling down. So, BC government, bless their soul. I say that because we can't ask them any questions in this instructive review panel. They asked, they asked a question, but you know, because if you don't submit evidence, you can't ask you any questions. So, even though BC government is part of this process, because they did not submit any evidence, we as interveners cannot ask them any questions about how they're going to manage stuff. And they keep telling us that we can't answer questions because we didn't submit evidence. Kind of an easy out. Yeah. Yeah. But they did ask the question, and this one was pretty good. So they, um, the, they said the proponent being Enbridge has identified the implementation of a remote leak detection system. The province understands that this system as proposed would detect a release of plus or minus 5% of the volume. So at 500,000 barrels per day, which is what the pipeline is going to do, 5% would be 25,000 barrels per day that it could leak, right? Okay, so those are the percentages. Then it goes on to say, um, and this was, this, this, the thing about this one is that the point is that at 5% or less, Enbridge can't detect the leak. So it's just like a slow leak that just goes on and on. So even if it's at less than 5%, it would be 25,000 barrels. Okay. So the province wants to know, is that correct? And it's true. So in actual fact, even though a full bore rupture would produce a lot of barrels of oil at one time, the, the small rupture, the small leak, the one that they can't detect is actually the more insidious one. Are they, um, there's going to be these pumps along the way. Yeah, there's I don't understand is if there's a leak near a pump, is that worse than if there's just a leak? I wouldn't suspect so. No. I, I have no, I'm not a, no expert on this, but there's pumps just to, to pump and apply pressure to um, pumping the oil and the condensate, yeah. right? Yeah. The pipeline's going to be buried, I understand. Yes. So if there's a leak, you're just only going to protect it. That's right, you won't. Yeah. Not until the, the oil emerges from the ground, right? Or hits a water course and then um, comes down the river. So, so a pinhole, the point is that a pinhole, pinhole leak is, is far more of a concern. Um, and the Calamo Zoo um, leaked uh, 19,500 barrels of dilbert. Well, it's actually 17 hours. The capacity of that pipe was only 190,000, whereas this capacity of this pipe is 500,000. Another, another interesting part, point of this pipeline is that the permit, or what they're asking for, permission to um, ship is 500,000 barrels. That's only the beginning. This pipe is capable of shipping 850,000 barrels per day. And that seems to be the intent of where it's going. So right now they're only doing 500,000. Just for reference to mm -hmm. the barrel of the barrel of the Good, good point. So the, the, and then after the Kalamazoo um, scenario, right, like John Brothers, um, who's, who's part of Enbridge, you know, and asked the uh, question of how Enbridge would be notified of a, of a leak. Um, he said, well, there's pressure drops. Like they have, they have you know, I don't know if you know that the control systems in Edmonton so they, they direct all the stuff that happens within the pipelines from Enbridge, most of it anyways, from a contr big control center in, in Edmonton. So they would, at the control center, know the pressure drops. They would know the volume imbalances. So they would know that there was something wrong by the amount of volume that was missing. 
then the bottom one, observations and monitoring for people living on the right of way. Well, nobody lives there. Nobody lives there. And no one. Like, I don't know who's supposed to do that. The joke is always the grizzly bears, but you know. Like, like nobody knows. And then the Canada Zoo, it was the public, right? That lived on the right of way that, that did notify them. And, and as we know from the news in the last while, from the National Safety Transportation Board from, uh, that did the review of the Kalamazoo still. It was quite damning of Inverage, right? They called them the Keystone Cops in the way they handled stuff. It was just a gong show. They went through sh three shifts and they said, well, it's not my problem, I'm going away. It's the next guy's problem. Like it was this careless attitude of, of accepting error, you know? When they came to Kitimat to talk about the spill, they actually had a new position that kind of overlooked and supervised the control room and, and tried to help the, the controllers problem solve stuff. So they had made some changes, but this is this whole this whole uh, culture, um, corporate culture, uh, that was wrong, you know, in trying to do this. They um, increased the pressure in the, in the pipeline twice. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. 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 They thought it was a. Yeah. What did they call it? Mm -hmm. Something. Abstraction. Yeah. 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 What it was called. Yeah. I had it before, but I can't remember. So they 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 cleaned up the river. <laughs> sort of. But they can't eat the fish. They can't swim in. They can't touch the water. Um, you know, they used chains on the river bottom because, of course. It's as we know now, the stuff sank, right? And they had to use um, stir up the goblets of oil with um, high pressure hoses and they had to use rotor tillers and blah, blah, blah. So the person that was in charge of that, I heard her speak, and, um, and she made it sound like it was all good and well, right? You know, they made claims that, you know, people from Kalamazoo or on the Kalamazoo River didn't have access to the Kalamazoo like they, they needed to have. So they built little parks and walkways. But they put little lights up so that you got dirty oil clean up. Um, yeah, this is crazy making stuff. You know, they tried to make it as sound as, as good as, as they could possibly, but they still haven't come to that. It's still not finished. I think it cost them eight hundred million dollars so far. They said they're gonna make it absolutely good to the end. And still cost more money. And this becomes part of the issue that's being talked about right now in Edmonton is about the insurance. You know, how much insurance have you got, Enbridge, to cover this spill? Right? We assess the people on the, on the, into the cross examiners are saying, from whatever level, are saying, we're not going to pay for this. The public's not going to pay for it if you spill. So have you got enough insurance? So there's all, all sorts of interesting things that are being said in that because they don't know who the owners are in, complete, in completion, right? They only know about six of the, of the, of the people that put the $10 million each forward to do this project. There's a couple of them are still unknown. So they don't even know who those people are. But anyway, it gets kind of interesting to look at. It's not a good idea. What are the owners of Chinese Oh yes, they are Chinese, we know that. Some of them we don't know. Yeah. Okay, sorry, can you go through that again? The six, say that again? I didn't quite. Well, for the project to, for Enbridge to embark on getting this proposal done. Yeah. I don't know how it came about, but 10 companies or 10 groups put $10 million in each or whatever. There was $100 million for Enbridge to do. Right, to, to fund the joint review process. To, yes, okay. to do that. And we don't know who they all are. A lot, a number of them have come forward, but some of them haven't. But two of them, is it two that are Chinese? Two of them, they know. Yeah, that they know what we're trying to say. Yeah. And the corporations where it is the government of China. Yes. Who owns the company. Yes, yes, exactly. It's the government of China, yes. So they have a really strong interest in this. And of course you know that, um, well, it's all in the news. It's, um, what is it? What's the name of the company they wanted to? Next. Next. Next, yeah. So you know that story. So it'll be interesting to see how the government handles this. Okay. All right. When, when they spoil your uh, private property,
property, for example, um, around the Kalamazoo River, um, you wouldn't see compensation for, if at all. But if you saw compensation, it wouldn't be for a very long time. Yeah, I think they bought some of the houses. So they actually bought properties and houses. There was a, well, I, I'm not here to speak about the Kalamazoo, no. but there was issues about um, them signing papers so they wouldn't make claims afterwards. Okay. Um, and, and the cleanup was not complete. And they had to quit in the wintertime. Um, in the wintertime, it got too cold, so they had to stop. And you know what temperature it was? It was five Celsius. You know, like, we're not talking cold. It was in around that. We looked, we looked it up, and the, the temperature was not like 30 below or 10 below. No, it, was, it, was, it wasn't cold. Anyways. So here's the other piece that Emory didn't tell you. So, what Emory did for the, the ports, for the port of Kitimat, and where they want to put this terminal, they had to do a comparison to other ports around the world. You know, in terms of how you get into it, in terms of um, complication and you know, difficulty and risk and all that. So this is, and, and Dave Shannon put this one together off of Google Earth. It's kind of, it's kind of interesting. And he actually put it in his evidence. Just an interesting piece before we start, because it, it also sits with the port. So um, Emory says within its project, because remember this is not just a pipeline project, this is Northern Gateway project, and it is a marine component. But the piece, the, the interesting piece about it that we have to always keep in mind is that Enbridge is responsible for the pipeline. And even though they're doing the stuff beyond the pipeline, they don't have any responsibility. Okay, and I'll get to that on another slide. But, so Enbridge has done some work in this area as part for um, this Northern Gateway project, but they're not responsible. Right? Anyways, they did a they did they looked at the services of different ports that had tugs. Because one of the things they they're, say they're committed to is that they're going to provide escort tugs for all the tankers going in and out. So this was just the 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 ports that they used. So we're looking at Valdez, Milford, Monstad, Hammerfest, um, Solomon, and Bjorn, Sweden. So I'll show you some maps on those. So this one here is Mill Ford Haven. In the UK, so this is a marine um, oil tanker terminal. So it's, um, you can see where the port is, it's not as clear as it could be. Um, but it's 15 miles out to open ocean. So it's got a little bit of dog lake in it. So that's um, Milford. And I think it was Milford that had a spill, the first ship in. It's always said that um, the most dangerous part of the shipping, we failed to recognize it, was right in the terminal. Mm -hmm. And uh, we always talk about the tankers, but one of the most dangerous places is at, is at the terminal. Anyways, this is Mondstadt in Norway, and Sret. Um, you can see there, from goes into ways, out 20 miles. Here's Hammerfest, Norway. Goes in, got a little bit of a dog leg. 30 Here's um, the sport in Sweden. Can it say this one? Like Bjorn Ford? 20 miles in and out to open ocean. And they defined what is confined and what is open ocean. Okay, so we haven't manipulated this at all. This is based on their definitions. So this is Solomon Boy. Um, this route here is, is 20 kilometers. So it goes in and out. Yeah, yeah, it is. Here's Valdez, um, Alaska. So it's got a little bit longer, it goes in 90 miles, so that many kilometers of that. About 120? Yeah, it goes in, and plus um, past the place where the, where uh, Games on Valdez went down, and it's got a bit of a, a road route in through the, the mountains and the, and the channel there to Valdez. Mm -hmm. 
Those are new laws they brought in with the tankers and the tugs, escorting. Yeah, in Valdez they have uh, they have escort tugs now. Yeah, they do. They didn't have that. No, and they're not laws either. Yeah, and I'll get to that in another in another place. Maybe. So here's Kitaman. Two hundred and twenty miles is what it is. So this is where they pick up they pick up the pilot um, um, past Triple Island there. Coming from the south, the map isn't complete, but they pick him up there and they go through Whale Channel, up through where the Queen of the North went down, right channel, right um, sound, and then in through Douglas Channel all the way to Canada. So that's the comparison that they're doing within this, these reports of the Joint Review Panel. That's what they're comparing it to. Why are there two routes? I never understood that. One in the north and one in the south. Good question. I'm not sure of the answer. Yeah, it know. could be weather, it could be access. I'm not sure about trains that go to, to Korea. It depends where it's going to. Yeah, yeah it could be. It doesn't depend on the weather. No. They both end up in Hecate Strait. Well, they go. They don't go. Hecate Strait is, is in that plate in the middle there, right? Mm -hmm. So they go okay. out through the north of it or out through the south of it. The only comparable one that was out there was with um, the Straits of Magellan, and it's um, 350 miles. They brought a, a VLCC, which is a very large crude carrier, and this, these ports are all about very large crude carriers with so the VLCCs. So they, they brought, um, they, they had four trips, and on the fourth trip they had a spill, and at that point they said no more. So they, they, they stopped it at that point, so they don't go through. So there's really no comparison for Kinemend for these for this transit at all of what they're trying to do. One of them, um, there's lots of been lots of thinkings. I wish Dave was here because he could talk for a long time about all these things because he, he has a, a great knowledge. Here's one here. Um, this is a 1993. Um, it was the big thing about this one. It ended up on the reef, and it was human error. A lot of a lot of them are human error. Lots of, we've got lots of stuff here, but I won't go over it um, here. There's just trying to build a history of what is, what is air and how many times an accident is potentially can happen on a route. So this was um, San Francisco Harbor, um, you know, so, and lots of things happen. You start looking at the history of why accidents happen, either the rudder sticks or the, the power goes off. I think there was one on the Douglas Channel, which was the Peter, what's it called, Terry? Peter Berg. Anyways, it was the, all their steering shut down. They rammed into an island, <laughs> or one of the, the shorelines, right? So things happen. You know? And then the other thing that, that we, that is often said, well, though, well we're double hulls. You know, everything's double hulls. 2015, everything's going to be double hulls. There's no problem. Well, Double house only were in a grounding, right, of less than five knots. These ships travel at eight to twelve plus. We're going to slow them down in the channel, like the Douglas Channel to eight to twelve. But the but a double hull doesn't work okay, for a grounding or for a collision at anything greater than five knots. So, as a, an expert had said when I asked the question, he said, "Double hulls are not the panacea for preventing oneself. Like they can." say that all they want and it's just not there. So these are just lists of accidents that happen, they're double hauls. Um let's be going on soon. I won't go over them. Any questions so far? The um, very large crew carriers, yeah. Um, I read that they carry two to three million barrels. Is that do you know? I don't know. All I know is they're very but the traffic is roughly 10 times. Pardon? I believe it's roughly 10 times what the standard compared to That ship that I showed you on the, the screen, the Scarlet Ibis, I think it was called, that's a 30,000 dead weight ton ship. A VLCC is a 330,000 dead weight ton ship. So a VLCC for length, I don't forget how many. I mean, they are, I forget, they're huge. The length just blew me away. There's laws that stayed at the Empire State Building. They're huge. 
Absolutely. And the very, very large DLCs. They've got big, bigger ones now. They're just short of the tallest building that's um, in New York or North America. Like, they're huge. Like, amazing. So, and, and, um, and I just have to give, well, I'm thinking of it, you know, one of the things that I've learned over, over the course of trying to understand this story is the absolute expertise of ship pilots and of captains. The absolute ability of these individuals to bring these ships in under really awkward circumstances and to make decisions like hugely, um, huge professional expertise these people have. And you know, just can't under, undermine or underestimate that. So when I talk about this part, um, you know, just keep that reminding us in there. A lot of stuff doesn't happen because of the expertise of these individuals. So Turnbull, here comes the shipping part. How many people are here for, what's, what's the organization called? Yeah. Defend Our Coast. Defend Our Coast. How many people are here for that? Lots of, yeah. Um, you might know what a turn pole is. Do you know what a turn pole is? I didn't know what a turn pole was. Anything how bright you get, how smart you get about different things. It's just incredible, right? Anyways, so a turn pole is something that a company voluntarily takes on. So they plan to make to, to ship a petrochemical. It's basically around petrochemical shipping that they do these things. So it, it is a, it's a technical review process that they use for um, operating marine terminals um, and for the marine transportation components of the project. So they, they have a, um, I think it was about 1972, 75, the government of Canada put together a, a template for these terminals. And it's been revised since then. I can't remember all the history. The thing about it is they're voluntary. So the interesting part when I started investigating is because we've got another liquid natural gas groups coming on to Kitimat too, right? There's about five of them want to come. Right? So you start asking around. They're already building the facility. You start asking around, like, have you done a turn pool? Oh, no, we haven't gotten around to it yet, right? Like, it's voluntary. We mean voluntary. So they'd like you to do it. Oh, I don't, you know, nobody's going to make you do it. So what, what does voluntary mean? Well, voluntary means that these are recommendations. They're not binding. Um, the proponent may choose to adopt one or more of them. And it's not done by a third party. It's not vetted by anyone else but them and who they hire. So you kind of, OK. So it would be nice to get some, some review of what they looked at if that doesn't happen. So, who gets involved in the term poll? Well, the term poll is done by the proponent, or whoever it is, it's in this case, the Northern Gateway. So they produce it, it was produced in about February uh, this year. And then Transport Canada reviews it. So Tra Transport Canada is the one that put out the template of what it should help what they need to do, but they also review it. Term poll for Transport Canada said in its review, Enbridge is in full compliance with the National Energy and National Regulatory Framework. Sounds good. What's that mean? So what does it mean? Do they internationally meet all the regulations? So internationally, they're obligated to have double piles by 2015. They are to have, obligated to have what they call segregated ballast. So if you puncture one area, only that one area gets ruptured, right? Not the whole ship. So you got an internationally recognized crew certification. You, got, you have to have a pilot if there's a pilot on board. If it's required, um, you have to have a certified response um, to a spill. So you have to have that connection um, to an organization in the area to respond to you. And you have to have an oil pollution emergency plan. What else do they have? These are all international. These are regulations. And you also have to have as to be a shipper in the world. Internationally, you have to have an electronic chart display. And by 2015, every ship will have to have this. So there's a few out there that don't, but everybody's going to have to have this. So these are things any shipper anywhere in the world is required to do by international law. Go ahead. I'm just curious as to what body governs you know, these international charters. Oh, I do, but I, I haven't written it down. But it's out there. 
Um, That's with the, okay. um, the compensation piece for oil spills. But then there's these um, marine organizations as well that are part of those, those um, uh, money pieces that are there for insurance purposes. But there's a whole body of international organization that, that is deep, put these laws out there. So if you can look them up, they're, they're fairly accessible. If you go to the term pool document, they go, they run through all that and they'll give you all that detail. Yeah. There's, no, uh, there's no escort no, no, they don't, they don't ask them by law, no, that's right. So, but these things are all by law. So everybody says, oh, but we're going to have double hull tankers, well, so everybody is supposed to, you know. So there's things that are being said that are just automatic. So then Transport Canada then states, that Enbridge has, in its review of the term pool, said that Enbridge's law has voluntarily put 17 other things in place. So they've committed to these that can, can reduce the probability of a spill and reduce the consequences. So these are the voluntary measures, and there's 17 of them, and I didn't put them all down here, but some of them are interesting. So voluntary measures. Um, so all laden tankers in a confined area have to be have two escort tugs, one of them tethered. Ballast tankers are to be accompanied by a closed, um, closed um, escort tug. Escort tugs are to be available for ocean rescue. Tugs are to be equipped with oil pollution emergency response equipment. Um, and the other thing is that they, Emory said that they're going to um, increase the um, capacity of oil response. Right now, it's only at 10,000 barrels. They have said that they are going to put in place equipment that will pick up 35,000 barrels. <laughs> so they, they've upped that. Yeah. So the other thing that they said they would do um, as, a, as a voluntary measure is that um, they, would they would install the radar to monitor the traffic and provide additional information to the Canadian Coast Guard Marine Services at then communication and traffic services. I was a little bit confused on this one, because I, I kind of thought that, that was the Coast Guard's job to do that, right? But you know what, I was wrong. Interesting, but anyway, I'll go on a little bit more about The other thing that, um, that um, Amber said they would do is they would set the limits covering the visibility and wind and sea conditions. And to give them credit, the pilots do that. They do it in, in organization of the pilots, but it's not, there's nothing um, legislated or mandated. You know, like, you shall not come here if this is happening, right? It's a judgment call. The other thing that they said they would, they would do, they would do uh, a proponents tankers acceptance program, which is almost redundant for what the Transport Canada does, because Transport, Transport Canada is supposed to vet all these um, these vessels, they have a program where they're supposed to look at them every number of years, if they're over a certain age, they, they have to do them more often. So that was a bit of a, an additional piece. Um, other, other pieces of emergency response, identifying and prioritization, uh, particularly sensitive areas. Well, that was an interesting one because, so you may identify them and prioritize them, but then what are you going to do? You know, so, so what? You know, you pass. 13 marine parks and you know <laughs> stuff like like what's that going to do? And then um, you know things like deploy booms around tankers during cargo operations. So those are all voluntary measures. So what does this mean? <clears throat> so Transport Canada acknowledges these are all voluntary, but it means that none of them are mandatory, nor is Enbridge legally bound to them at all. Right. So for Transport Canada. As far as I was concerned when I read this thing, I was just abhorred when I read it, I was really angry. Um, it was to distance itself as far as possible from the voluntary measures of just saying, sure, you can do these, these are nice, go ahead. But you know what? In Transport Canada's view, all is well, right? Even the largest VLCC can navigate the entire route unassisted by, by the tugs, including the S-turn. And I'll show you the S-turn. In fact, the S-turn 
is such that um, you're not supposed to do a reverse S2 in the term, but this is it, and I'll show you what it looks like. In Transport Canada's in view as well, all is well in that well, the current navigational aids are completely adequate, including right sound. There's, there's no, they say there's no additional requirements for Douglas Channel at all. Now that may sound really well and fine here, because guess what? You've got the best services possible down in the south. But you know what? There's holes in the service up in the upper room there. Here's right sound. We don't have any radar here at all for ships. There are six converging traffic areas here for ships. There's the one with the green is the inline, inland um, inner passage where the ferries go and all the shipping goes up and down the coast to Alaska. There's the routes coming in five and six and from the um, and eight coming in from the from the south and then the ones coming from the north from the Douglas Channel because Douglas Channel is on one side and then the other side is burning passage. So, but there's no there's, so there's no radar here. And government dependent and transport Canada says this is okay, no problem, no problem at all. And there's no problem with that S curve, even though, even though they say within their own mandate that a reverse curve is not the best. So they go into a curve and then they have to go a straight distance. I think the distance is five times the length of the ship it's supposed to be, and I think they've got um, maybe twice as much as the distance as they need. And then they have to do a reverse curve. Queen of the North is saying, right, we're here. Can't wait. <laughs> That's what she's saying. So there's a bit of a history here. Hartley Bay is just up at the top of that Promise Island. There's a little island. Uh, oh, a little higher. <laughs> up where the two is, up on shore. That's where Hartley Bay is. So this is a major area. So, but according to Transfer Canada, all is well. It's no problem. So everything is fine as it is, and we don't, we don't require you to do anything else. If you don't want to put any radar there, fine. If you don't want to put any, uh, you don't want to use your um, tongs, that's okay, etc. It would be nice if Enbridge does what it says it will do. It'll help make things safer, and they say this. Um, these are commitments, and I put promises. Nothing will be legislated, nor will be demanded in this process. So, the problem that Transport Canada actually has is they do have some responsibilities. They have to check out these ballasts and these ships. They're obligated to check them out. They, guess what? Um, there's no ballast, dirty ballast treatment facility in Kinnaman. No, to give them a fair shake, um, a lot of these newer ships have a fairly sophisticated system where they can clean the ballast, et cetera, et cetera. But um, they, have to, they have to monitor, and it's their responsibility to do that. And they're kind of groaning and moaning because there's potentially going to be an additional 250 um, vessels per year. And with all the LNGs coming in, um, sh ships as well, there's probably going to be 450 or plus. So they have a problem because guess what? They cut their staff. Right? Their federal funding is being decreased and they have a couple of staff to do this. The Auditor General's report in 2011 said that Transport Canada is currently not doing the job, nor is the Coast Guard. They don't have the money or the resources or the funds. You know that here. It's the Coast Guard station that went down. Jericho, right? Thanks. We know all that. So the situation is the government cannot do what they are supposed to do. They don't want anything more to do. Nor do they want to legislate any measure that might make the situation as safe as possible. So they've, they've said, it's okay, you, you, don't, you don't need to do this, we didn't do it, that's nice. We know as well that shippers and corporations are profit driven. So it may start off fine with all living in place, but as soon as things tighten up, then what? They're not mandatory, we don't have to do them, we can drop them. And that's kind of what happened in Valdez. They do have the, the tugs there. They're not legislated, I don't believe. They tried to reduce the number of tugs but they had a citizens group there, uh, an independent citizens group at that uh, that pressured and they, they remained. But they so, and there was a fellow from Valdez that came and spoke um, 
to us years ago now, it must have been at least four or five years ago, from Exxon Valdez, and he said, make sure they legislate stuff. Make sure these things are in place to make this safe, because if it isn't, anything can go. Right? So other things that we happening in us are where we are. There's um, Douglas, for Douglas Channel, we have lots of these LNG projects happening. Um, each of them, hopefully, are going to do a voluntary term poll. Okay. So, so I asked the question of Transport Canada, because they did come. And I said, does anyone think of, and I asked the question as an intervener, because we can ask these written questions, etc. I asked them, does, does anyone think of coordinating these? And you, and, or do you know of any other term polls that are happening? Oh, yeah, but no, we don't coordinate them. Nobody's got, you know, nobody does this. Nobody talks, nobody talks to one another how they're going to do this. So Douglas Channel and Port of Kinemet will go up to about 900 transits per year. That doesn't sound like much here, because you get lots of ships, but it's a lot where we are and what's happening here. The other interesting thing is about the radar. Um, um, when I asked about questions about that, it sounds like they want to privatize all that. If you're somebody that wants to ship out whatever, and you need that radar there, you pay for it. And one of the things that's kind of holding up the whole conversation is because I think Cambridge doesn't want to pay for it all. They know there's other shippers going to be happening, so why shouldn't we share it, right? But anyways, there's lots of lots of issues, but the government is not mandating it. As soon as they mandate it, of course, they have to pay for it, and they have to maintain it. So that's not happening. So these are our waters, and nobody's stepping forward really to protect them. Wants to do the project. project. We don't feel the governments are, are stepping up to do what they should be doing. Um, as citizens, we're trying to take a more active role and be critiquing what's happening at the JRP. Um, and as citizens, at least I do, I was naive though, <laughs> I expect governments to protect and take a responsible role in the protection of our environment in a sustainable way. I've been naive, <laughs> you know, truly naive. Um, and our governments are doing this, either the federal or the provincial or the municipal. They're all just sitting back waiting. All levels are waiting for the results of the JRP, except the federal government, because we know where they're coming from. They've already made their decision, right? We know that. So I just, I, this was a, a, a PowerPoint that I did for our council that is neutral, doesn't want to ask any questions or make any decisions. But I had to make the point that inaction makes you impotent to have any impact on the process. And, and to have our ability to protect the sustainability of our environment or our economy. We need to be involved. Really, we need to pay attention to what's going on. And I'm glad you're here because you are paying attention and you're interested, but you really need to ask a lot of questions of what's going on. And when you're talking about defending the coast, um, it's, the coast is at the mercy of corporate profits. You know, they want, that's what it's about. Um, and it's about the mercy of, of, of governments that cannot or will not act in a way that, that is, you know, protects our coast and makes it sustainable. I put it up here, as a citizen, I'm totally dismayed. I cannot believe kind of what's going on and where it's going. So you need to speak, you need to listen, and be involved. And I'm glad you're, you are. It's really reassuring and, and to see that, that it's happening here and that awareness is, is going on. Um, yeah. Any questions? Uh, Douglas Channel itself, does it have a lot of uh, islands and rocks in it? Like, uh, not the channel itself. There's a lot of islands. It's narrow. The narrowest part is about a kilometer wide. Okay. Narrow and hard. Yeah, and then it opens when it gets to Hartley Bay. That's when it, it shallows out and that's when there's a lot of rocks and open areas, right? Um, going through Kamanistan, there's a lot of <coughs> shoals and lots of rocks. Just out of Hartley Bay, when it goes through that estuary, it opens up into um, a lot of open, you know, rocks and islands. Well, the islands are in close, because the whole thing right from Kidanat on right out is these islands, right? Is that, um, you know, recently how like what was the consequences of, do you, do you think, to Enbridge when they released that video that removed? Like, I, you know, like, to me, that was just like, well, that's the nail in the coffin. You know what I mean? Like, you would think, 
but I just, I, that just blew my mind. <laughs> well, yeah, well, yeah, and it's just about minimizing what the risk is. Yeah, exactly. It, it's about um, trying to uh, say to people it's okay, look, it's just an open ocean. It's way for kid about right over it's a problem. Yeah. And uh, we saw that um, quite a while ago, and we kind of chuckled, and then somebody, like, who was it that got hold of that and said, oh, this is really not right. We yeah. had a big issue out of it, right? But it's been around for a while, that, that video. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I to, um, I was up, uh, this summer, I was up at Maurice River. Yes. And uh, that's it, we had a, um, action panic there. Yes. Blockade. Yes. And um, they're uh, they're saying that the pipeline right away is three kilometers wide and has approximately eight pipelines going through it. Yeah. Uh, that's what the plan is. Yeah. They built a huge log cabin and the camp is all all outfitted. It was 250 people in the middle of nowhere this summer. So that's great. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> the point I found out was that Enbridge actually owns has natural gas interests also, and they bought into the pipeline as a you know as a, as a silent partner. Yeah. So the idea is that they're the natural gas railways are paving the way uh, for oil. And you're right, and very much so. And the problem is, for the actual pipelines, is they only have to, like the LNG pipelines, they only have to meet provincial review. And the environmental piece is very much less, was, was always less rigorous than the federal piece. Now the federal piece is, is less rigorous because of the, the changes that happened in June, but the, the provincial piece was always that way. So we've always, you know, we've been kind of sideswiped a little bit by the Enbridge piece um, because we haven't been able to pay attention to the other pipelines in the way that they should have been paid attention to because there's going to be a lot of environmental damage mm -hmm. done by those pipelines mm -hmm. and, um, and we're kind of neglecting that mm -hmm. and we need to pay, we should pay attention but They've already got approval, right? You start looking at them and they're all ready to go. They're just, yeah. Well, again, getting back to the, the kind of game that's being played out, uh, they do shell companies, so they'll say a limited partnership. Mm -hmm. And it, you, you really don't know who's responsible. It is, it's, they set up shell companies as they go along, so there's no one company responsible for a lot of stuff. Yes. From the company. Well, that's another thing that has to be brought up, but nobody's come up with an answer. Yeah, and Robin Allen has brought that up in, I don't know if you're familiar with her, she's one of the interveners from, from the Alberta Federation of Labor, has been doing a lot of investigating that, because this limited partnership of, of Northern Gateway, who are you? What, what is your your financial obligation? Like Enbridge in itself could um, pay for cleanup, because it has a, a lot of resources, but what about the limited partnership? Because you can only pay for as, as much as you have, right? So, can, can I, is so, so, are you saying that so the, the Northern Gateway Pipeline is not, there's no legal connection between Enbridge and the pipeline? Like it's owned by the limited partnership and there's no way to... I, I can't, I can't speak to that, right? But I know it's a different company. That's what we were talking about, about a month ago, all these shell companies that they were just set up uh, really? to avoid that rule. So the other thing is that was did you just say that Enbridge has an interest in Pacific Trail Spectrum? Yes. Enbridge has a, an interest in natural gas. They they have they have they, Enbridge has is in is in the business of transporting natural gas. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And wind power and solar power. They're into a whole bunch of stuff. And person. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that, that one. That one. The first private my goodness. Um, prison. Private prison. Prison. In the prison. Hmm. Whoa. So, so I guess the big thing though is you need to be aware of what's going on. You need to be aware of the spin. I had Patrick, I asked Patrick Daniels at a 
at a big forum one time, um, you know, about a, a, a question, I forget what the question was. But anyways, he said that Enbridge has a moral obligation to supply energy to the world. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> I thought, wow, this man really, you know, believes that too. Sure, that was great. Really, really great. Thank you very much.